Um, basically, we're going to, you know, a few years ago when I presented at the PDA show, talked about the four different risk options that uh, typically we saw with uh, sort of tour level golfers, like sort of a risk option A, which was a stable extension toward flexion model. We had a Cobra pattern, or I would call it Cobra pattern. Risk option B was flexion toward extension model. And then there were some hybrid versions sort of uh, in between that. We had sort of a, a down cocking model and a uh, and sort of a hybrid model in between A and B. So what I wanted to talk about today, um, I'm here at uh, lovely THD uh, World Headquarters in Toronto here. Um, I'm going to share with you a little presentation that I've, I've sort of put together looking at two of the patterns because I would say the majority of tour players would exhibit more or less some version of wrist option A or wrist option B. That's sort of the most prevalent patterns that we generally see. So I want to kind of go through that and share a, a, a little presentation with you as I do this on those two uh, models here. So basically, uh, we're going to re-examine a little bit of, of some of the body orientations. This is, is where I get into a lot of um, kind of fun looking at different sort of body movements that are going to support the wrist actions. So we need to, as, um, as Mark Crossfield was saying, you know, we need to test, we need to make sure we understand what the player is doing at the wrist and elbow level. But from there, we can see that there are some advantages from a body orientation standpoint to support these two risk conditions. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Um, when we look at the graph on this, this is generally what we see with the graph here is um, kind of a stable, this is actually Thor Brown Olsen, we're going to look at his swing in a second, a very stable extension right here and then that flexion toward impact. We usually see the, the purple, um, which is the rotational value, uh, look a little bit like a sine curve, kind of equal on both sides of the coin here, more or less running through the zero line um, at impact. And one of the important things we have to understand about wrist stuff is we have to understand where the club head speed goes. So players that are utilizing this type of wrist action um, are generally going to allow the speed to move with the rotation a little bit axially around the shaft, okay? Um, what that does is that stabilizes the extension amount. So the green value is, is fairly stable through the impact zone. Uh, the ulnar radial amount, the blue line there is also very stable for a little while into that downswing. So we get a very long flat spot with this type of um, wrist option. Now, <clears throat> a couple quick things just before we get into the body orientation. One of the things we have to be careful about is overloading the radial deviation at the top of the backswing because as we know, as we push the wrist toward radial deviation, it also wants to move into extension. So as that lead wrist moves into extension, a lot of times what's gonna happen is we're going to see a much more difficult uh, task of pushing the wrist back into flexion. Um, generally, these players have a club face vector, okay? So basically the vector is, is where that, that face is, not only in the left to right axis, but also a loft axis. So that overall club face vector generally has more loft and, is, and a right bias coming into impact. And we tend to de-loft this and turn that face down if you will, uh, more than some of the other release styles like wrist option B. So this release becomes this turn down. Um, generally, if the player is very good at this, they can control the dynamic loft through impact quite nicely, hit stingers, hit higher shots, because they're basically playing around with the flexion amount. So we generally see this release in most uh, push drawers and push fade players, okay? So generally those players that like to hit push fade and push draw, um, often these players have some version of this wrist option A. The other uh, great thing about wrist option A is they tend to be excellent chippers, pitchers, and wedge players because on those shots where controlling the trajectory, controlling the bounce, controlling the dynamic loft, if we're able to create a little bit of supination, we stabilize the bounce and the dynamic loft by doing that. So we kind of rob Peter to pay Paul. We you know, have a little bit more face rotation but we're able to stabilize the loft and the bounce a little bit. So generally these players tend to be high block and overdraws on the miss patterns. Um, now, when we look at wrist option B here, you know, this is completely backward, completely different. The lead wrist moves from flexion toward extension late in the downswing. Uh, 
So generally, this is utilized by many of the highest and straightest slight fade players in the game today. So you could kind of put players like DJ uh, Brooks Kepka, certainly Victor Hovland, uh, a little bit Colin Morikawa, generally into this type of a pattern where they're building some flexion early and then they're releasing some of the flexion later on. So when we look at this graph of Dustin here, I mean, the reason I've chosen to do these two player swings is that they, they were very polar opposite. So like Mark was saying about extremes and outliers, sometimes we learn the most by looking at those outliers a little bit. So in this case, uh, DJ pushes that risk 70 degrees toward flexion, okay, which is an unbelievable amount. Most human beings can't sort of uh, do that. Uh, but we see toward impact how that flexion is being released toward extension. So the two components that we're going to talk about today that are really important are the supination or the purple line, the rotational line. These players are opening the radial bone on their lead wrist or lead arm about 30, 40, 50 degrees at impact, um, more so than at address. So they're holding the radial bone open and allowing the wrist to move toward extension. Now, when we do that, okay, we're sort of stabilizing to a certain extent the, the rotationary plane, if you will, a little bit. We're allowing the speed and the squaring up process to be in the extension. Now, the wrist obviously isn't in extension. It's still in flexion at the moment of impact, but it's moving rapidly toward extension. Okay, so very, very different. So a couple of quick things. Um, you know, the nice thing about flexion in that lead wrist, it keeps out the excessive radial deviation or the, the lag, if you want to call it, at the top of the swing. So players that employ this wrist option generally have less lag at uh, P5 or halfway down in that downswing um, than players that perhaps utilize wrist option A. The club face vector has less law, okay, and a slightly right bias entering the impact. So these players actually have the law pushed into the ground before impact, and they are gaining loft as they come through impact. So this is where it's completely backward to the uh, wrist option A, okay? So wrist option A, we're turning the loft down. Wrist option B, we're adding loft uh, around impact with the vector. Now, these players tend to have a more pivot-driven, less axial or less twisted release, if you will. And really, if you could call it a measured scoop release where the club face vector moves a bit more vertically, which might have more change in the dynamic loft and bounce angle through impact interval, but might be more consistent from a start line. So generally, we see this release in mid to high fade players uh, on tour these days. The misses tend to be lower right and higher left than option A. Um, I find a lot of players that utilize this type of release model are fantastic drivers of the ball, long clubs hitting them high and far, uh, perhaps less consistent in their wedges and the chipping if we're going to use this. So a lot of the players that I coach, I will teach them if they have wrist option B in the long game, I will teach them wrist option A in the short game. Um, one of the reasons why Victor Hovland struggled with his pitching and chipping uh, at certain times in his career is because of the way he utilizes the flexion to extension. He's changing the bounce, he's changing the dynamic loft quite a bit through the bottom of the swing with that type of a movement. Um, lately, he's been rotating the toe a little bit, rotating the face a little bit more, becoming more like wrist option A. I think that's a good move to, uh, for players to be able to control the bounce on the chips and the pitches better. Now, when we look at these uh, swings, so we're going to put these two swings up against their um, sort of data, and we're going to look a little bit at their swing um, and specifically what they're doing with the lead arm and the lead upper arm is very important here. So when we look at setup here, we're going to see a couple really uh, important ideas here. Right at setup, so if you're going to use wrist option A, it's best to have the upper arm of the lead arm slightly internally rotated at setup. So the bicep is going to be about 20 to 30 degrees internally rotated. The radial bone is also 20 to 30 degrees internally rotated at setup. Uh, weight distribution is a little bit more even. Uh, the pelvis is a little bit more level in this type of a golf swing. Uh, DJ is setting up a little bit behind the ball, if you want to call it, rear posting. Uh, a little bit more tilt in his pelvis at setup. But his upper arm, the bicep, is actually externally rotated. And this is the most important part of what we're going to get in today, is understanding what the upper arm is going to do 
to help support the wrist action. So when we look at this with a little bit of help of um, Sportsbox AI, what we have here is a cool view of some angles and some body movements and so on. Um, Thor Bjorn here has less lead arm adduction. So if he doesn't load that lead arm across his chest, uh, we'll call this a more connected in front of him swing. Pelvis is a little bit more level at the top. There's less rotation and less thoracic extension. Now, DJ has much, much more lead arm adduction. We can see that from the overhead view. Uh, these, by the way, these sports box uh, models are those exact swings I just showed you, okay? Um, the pelvis is more tilted. Uh, there's more rotation and thoracic extension. So law number one in club head speed is length in the hand path. DJ is doing a much better job of that. Turns about uh, 11 degrees more with some thoracic, five degrees more thoracic extension at the top of the swing. So DJ does have a much longer hand path, um, let alone obviously he's six foot four. So he's got also a longer hand path that way. Uh, here's where it gets a bit interesting. Okay, so Thor Bjorn here on the way down actually has a larger X factor at P5. So he has a 41 degree X factor between pelvis and chest, or uh, sorry, pelvis and thorax uh, at P5. Pelvis is more square at P5. The chest is moving into flexion, uh, which is helping to create space for the lead arm. And that's the important part here. When we look at the forward bend here, Thor Bjorn's actually bending uh, five degrees more forward here than DJ is at the same point. Now, length of clubs, height, all these things are going to be some consideration here. But essentially, by having that little bit of thoracic uh, flexion as Thor Bjorn comes down, that's creating space for his arms. Okay. So if he were to early extend and actually, you know, pull his chest back a little bit, uh, much better chance that the right arm is going to get caught behind him, get stuck, if we will. Now, Justin, you know, actually has more closed body angles at P5. So the pelvis is more tilted um, in the left bend um, and the spine is a little bit taller, but he's a more side bend. Now, this is interesting. So Dustin at this point hasn't rotated as much to a certain extent as Thorbjorn. Um, so there's two different ways here of getting that trail arm back in front of the hip. So Thorbjorn is doing it with the, the, uh, the thoracic flexion. DJ is doing it with the thoracic side bend, okay? So two different ways of getting the arms back in front of the body. Now, when we look at impact, okay, this is where it gets crazy. Um, Thorbjorn moved his chest 79 degrees from P5 to impact. So he's rotated his chest 79 degrees. The pelvis has moved 38 degrees uh, from P5 to impact. There's less forward motion in Thorbjorn's swing. So his pelvis is only swayed 2.6 inches forward toward the target. Um, and he's slowing the pivot down to allow the lead arm to move externally. And that's the important part about the setup. So we started, Thorbjorn started with the arm about 20 to 30, degree, 30 degrees internally rotated, the upper bicep. And that, at impact, he's now externally rotated that. So he's used that left arm's rotation, the upper arm's rotation, to help create the rotation in the radial bone um, to get that rotational value back through uh, zero, roughly. Now, Dustin, on the other hand, this is where it gets interesting, has moved his chest 91 degrees from P5 to impact. So... He hasn't rotated as much early in the downswing as Thorbjorn, but he's actually rotated much, much more um, through to impact. His pelvis has moved 55 degrees from P5 to impact. He's got more pelvic sway. That creates more tilt in his pelvis, okay? Combined with the rotation amount allows the lead arm to stay more internal. So this is, again, what is very, very cool about this is DJ is actually starting with the arm, the upper arm externally rotated, but in impact it's actually internally rotated, which is turning the radial bone 30 to 40 degrees to the right at impact. And that's what we see on his graph. That's what we see at the wrist level, okay? So some very, very, very cool stuff with the orientation of that upper arm. Um, so when we look at kind of what they're doing is Thorbjorn is shutting down the pivot to allow the rotation of the upper arm to be able to square the club face. DJ is doing the opposite. He's driving the pivot much harder, which is basically keeping the upper arm and the radial bone open at impact. 
So completely different opposite movements in that arm to support the wrist action that they choose to use. Um, by the time we get to the finish here, because Thorbjorn has uh, slowed his pivot somewhat versus DJ, this allows that lead arm to continue to rotate and that elbow is now gonna bend a little bit more vertically down toward his hip bone, okay? Dustin's lead arm orientation stays internal longer before it starts to fold. So uh, in extreme cases, players like Victor Hovland uh, actually chicken wing a little bit with this release because they're holding that radial bone to the right. What that does is the stress of the uh, inertia of the golf club is actually breaking the lead wrist into extension, which is then causing a counter rotation or an opposite rotation in the elbow and the shoulder and creates a mini chicken wing. Okay, and there are players, Jordan Spieth, Victor Hovland, uh, Lee Westwood to a certain extent, have a little bit of this going on in the release. Now, the difference though is because DJ was rotating so much more, we see a P9 here, much, much more rotational values. Again, 14 degrees more at, at sort of P9 here than, um, than Thorbjorn. So the finish of these players is going to look different based on the way that the upper arm works. So if we go backward for a minute here, I'm just going to pull ourselves back to the video and just watch the video a couple of times here. Um, with that appreciation, I want you to kind of look at this and, and understand how that player is using rotation and that upper arm to be able to influence what's going to happen at the release level. Okay. Thorbjorn, again, is starting internally rotated. He's going to crank his rotations a little bit harder than DJ early in the downswing. And then he's slowing the pivot and allowing the upper arm and the radial bone to basically square up to zero where he started. Okay. And even though, you know, we're squaring this up, there's still some extension post impact. There's still some movement toward radial deviation. One thing that we have to learn is that the club head speed has to go somewhere. So at high speed with driver swings, it's going to be very, very difficult to sustain, let's say, a flat left wrist forever. Okay. Bryson does a pretty good job of, of trying to do that. Um, but in reality, it's going to break a little bit in all directions with the driver here. Now, DJ, as we can see, pushing that wrist hard, hard, hard into flexion. Okay, comes on down, lets some of that flexion out, but because his body is rotated much more open and tilted, this is keeping that upper arm internally rotated in the downswing, which is allowing him to hold the radial bone 40 degrees more open at impact and allow the speed and the squaring up to happen in the extension plane. Okay, so very, very, very different um, sort of mechanisms at play here. So quick little picture here, we see the setup, lead arm is internally rotated, that wrist is extended, uh, certainly at setup here. At impact, you can see how that upper arm has externally rotated, the radial bone has externally rotated slightly as he's pushed the handle more forward and flattened that left wrist, okay? So the upper arm placement, if you've got a player that's gonna be wrist option A or have a turn down release, take a look at their upper arm orientation. If they've got it external, they're gonna have a really hard time being able to create supination and flexion values to be able to um, make this release work consistently. If you've got a player that tests out into the Cobra style, okay, we wanna set that upper arm external. We watch uh, Victor Hovland sets his arm very external with both arms that set up, but this is allowing that upper arm to actually move internally toward impact, which is holding the radial bone open. And as DJ has built more flexion than he needs uh, at impact, he can now release some of that flexion away. So the position, the orientation of the arms at setup, some of the mechanisms in the swing itself in terms of the rotational and tilt values, those things will change based on that release style. So with wrist option A, players should set up that upper arm internally rotated to allow the external movements into impact, aid in the squaring up of the wrist. Players need to be cautious in overloading that lead arm adduction at any point in the swing, uh, 
because lead arm adduction increases its move towards internal rotation. So if you take your left arm out in front of your chest and you start to load that across your chest, you'll gain more range of motion if that lead arm is internally rotated. Um, so if we have excessive amounts of lead arm adduction, it's going to be more difficult to get that back out later. Players will use a slower pivot action through impact to allow a reduction in that lead arm adduction. So they're basically throwing that lead arm a little bit out in front of them, which is going to help them turn it, which is going to help them turn the radial bone. It's going to help them turn the upper arm into impact a little bit and get this turn down style release. Players also cannot slide the pelvis excessively because if I get ahead of it too far, this opens the lead arm internally. So if you were to take a, a club and just slide your hips massively toward the target, you're going to have a harder time turning this thing down and squaring the face up. So that's our obviously our common block. So these players tend to sit in the middle a little bit more, uh, stay behind it with their pelvis a little bit more at impact and allow that rotation to square things up. Um, wrist option B players, players should set up with that upper arm externally rotated set up to allow the internal movements of the upper arm to hold the face open. That's the feel at least through impact. Players need to overload that lead arm adduction because when the lead arm adduction increases, it helps to maintain uh, more toward the ideal impact interval rotation. So what that means is basically as I load that lead arm adduction across my chest at whatever point, DJ does it at the top of the swing, Rory does it halfway down. As I load that lead arm adduction a little bit, that basically holds the radial bone a little bit more open, okay? So players must have the ability to rotate and tilt very quickly in a wrist option B pattern. So it's not for everybody, uh, certainly generally not for your uh, slow overweight uh, amateur golfers that we all deal with every day. Um, it's a difficult pattern if we cannot separate uh, and move very, very quickly and tilt very quickly, okay? Um, most players cannot hold that lead arm reduction throughout that downside. So players can slide the pelvis more. DJ was sliding about 4.6 inches forward with the pelvis at impact. Um, then the wrist option A player, again, sliding the pelvis more forward helps to keep the lead arm internally situated. Now, conclusion here, um, basically not only are the wrist movements throughout the golf swing in these two methods polar opposite, the underlying body orientations must be built to support these wrist actions, okay? So mixing structural components like lead arm adduction amounts in the swing and the upper arm orientation at setup could produce some disastrous results. Wrist option A, set up internal upper arm, less lead arm adduction throughout the swing, feel the turn down release. The body is there to support the movement of the arms and wrists. That's a general basic sort of um, pattern development. Wrist option B, the setup is external upper arm, more lead arm adduction throughout the swing, Feel the body turn and side bend quite heavily through impact. The body leads and pulls the wrist conditions through. So wrist option A is going to feel what I call a pull-push pattern. So you're going to feel you're going to pull for a little while, and then you're going to sort of slow the pivot and feel a little bit of push. And that little bit of push from the right, as well as the upper arm rotating, is going to help us square this up and turn the release down. And wrist option B is a total pulling pattern. So basically that player is leading that, loading that lead arm reduction and pulling and tilting and side bending through impact and continuing that sort of pulling feel through the impact area. Um, so thank you certainly for your time today. I got some time for uh, a few questions here. So I'm just gonna push this back to... Uh... Uh, there's a question from Wayne uh, asking, it would be great if you could demonstrate some of the points. Maybe you could uh, just quickly do like a one or two minute demonstrate, demonstration of the lead arm adduction and, uh, and how that works. Yeah, so basically, hopefully you can see me here. So basically, you know, how the upper arm here on that left side sort of is situated is going to influence what it does later on. Okay, so in a wrist option A, if I turn the, the bicep here about 20 to 30 degrees internally rotated and set up like this, later on, what that's gonna allow me to do is as I slow my pivot slightly, this is gonna allow me to go ahead and turn this down. So at impact, the middle of my bicep, the radial bone, as well as that left wrist are gonna be fairly flat. 
okay? So I'm starting this way so that I can be this way at any time. Okay, it works in opposite order here. Now, DJ is doing the opposite. He's starting with this arm quite externally rotated, okay? Still internally rotated in the radial bone a little bit, but he's external in the shoulder. Now, as he comes through, he loads this lead arm. So the more I load this lead arm like this across my body, okay, this is rotating. My bicep is now internally rotated, okay? So this is moving this way. This is why we see with those Cobra players that radial bone is held 40 degrees open, 30 degrees, 40, 50 degrees open. The player is essentially sliding and tilting like this and allowing the speed to go this way. Okay, so this is how they're squaring up that mechanism. Whereas wrist option A players are internal and they are actually turning this down. Okay, so that elbow is now going to move toward my hip bone, okay, or else basically my biceps now on top. And that's allowing me to create the dynamic law um, that, I, that I'm situated with. So that's why I think we see a lot of great pitchers and chippers with that type of a movement. Because as I'm learning to do this, a good player is going to, you know, like Bryson, if I want a really low one, I'm going to go ahead and add more flexion and actually add even more supination, okay, or turn this down even more. So sometimes we see the purple value actually on the positive side of the chart on the graph because the player has held the wrist in the flexion. So the more flexion I put into that lead wrist, the more I need to supinate this to square the face. Okay, so a higher shot's gonna have less rotation and less flexion, okay? So good players are playing around with that mechanism all the time to be able to hit different trajectories and different shots. Um, a good player's gonna say, okay, there's my stinger, okay? Here's my neutral high ball. Okay, they're going to play around with how much of the flexion amount and the supination in the, in the entire arm they utilize. So the body has to be a situation. If I get a swing where I overload that knee arm reduction with a wrist option A player, they're coming down and they can't, they can't get this thing to turn down. So they're going to hit a high block. So a lot of times with those players, when they get the blocks going, they're overloading the arms too much. And then they can't actually make their release work. So they can't quite square this thing up. They leave it open, they hit it out to the right. Um, if I go ahead and come down and obviously over-rotate this and, and maybe turn this down, or even worse, if I add a little bit of rotation and the wrist goes into extension, well, now I've got a double closing happening. Okay, so now that vector on the club face is now going hard left, I get a low hook. So, like any style here, we're going to see some, some misses. And, and the key is obviously better players have smaller misses, but we're still going to see some variation in these misses. So that's why if I can keep the lead arm reduction a little bit wide or not load it so much, that, and then Thorbjorn goes into a little bit of flexion like this, that creates the space for his arm then to turn down like this. Mm -hmm. okay? Now DJ is loading this thing way back here. Okay, that wrist is in crazy amounts of flexion. He's coming down. Now he has to keep turning and tilting and turning and tilting and turning and tilting. So he gets here at impact where this radial bone is 40 degrees open and this wrist is now moving this way. Okay, so completely, completely backward uh, from each other. That's why I chose those two patterns as well as the body orientation. The ball are also completely different. So when we look at the wrist, it's important that we obviously understand the hack motion data, understand what you're looking at, but also you should also understand there are going to be some body moves that either support those wrist conditions or are going to hurt those wrist conditions. So we need to be aware of some of those things. And the biggest thing that I saw when going through a lot of those, those swings in the early research was how these players kind of set up that lead arm, okay, and how they use the upper arm to either help them uh, turn this down or resist turning it down. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a question uh, about how grip orientation in relation to the arm uh, uh, relates to this. Yeah, great question. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, my personal preference, certainly for um, a wrist option A player is we're going to have the, uh, the base, of the radial bone where it joins your wrist right here. Okay, we're going to make sure that this is a little bit up and over the grip. Okay, it's going to be a little bit on the stronger side because I need to have about four, depending on the, on the, on the club, 
somewhere between four to six inches of forward press here at impact. So when I start with that wrist a little bit more extended in this position, this is allowing me then to create a little bit more forward press. At the same time, you can see how my arm orientation has, as I push this forward, now the bicep and the radial bone are basically up on top. So the grip position has a lot to do with it. Sometimes you'll see a player with a weak grip, okay, with that left side. And then it's a little bit harder because to get that turn down, they basically have less range of motion this way, okay? Um, uh, so some of those players, like a John Ron that have a weak left hand grip, are going to add deflection. They're going to be some sort of a little bit more of a cobra style, if you will, as opposed to a turn down style. So the weaker the grip, generally the radial bone starts more toward the target, the bicep starts more toward the target, and now it's going to be harder. I have less range of motion. Now, this is something that Bryson does, obviously, a little bit with his driver. So he's convinced here if he kind of um, basically rotates his radial bone as far as he can to the left of setup. That's why he's in such a crazy weak grip on that left side. But then he's also trying to keep his upper arm internally rotated. So it's a little bit of a, uh, an odd movement here. But what he's done is locked out the elbow by being internally rotating the upper arm and let's say supinated here or, uh, with the lower arm with the radial bone is as long as he doesn't change this, he feels like he can't hook it, he can't hit the left. Anyways, I think it's harder to do that a little bit simply because I think for some players, you know, this arm is going to want to move, that upper arm is going to want to move. So if I hold it internal, it's very difficult to hold that. Um, but in his case, obviously you can do it. So I would say for most of our golfers that struggle with slicing the ball, hitting it to the right, who don't square the face up, give them a generous amount of internal rotation on all of these with a fair amount of extension. Now they can create flexion easier as well as they have more range of motion in the, let's say the supination or the rotation value um, in that setup. For the wrist option B player, you know, again, DJ's, very strong with the grip here. So the lower arm is about the same because the upper arm is more external here. Okay. He is simply using that setup. I, I don't advocate generally too weak a grip unless you're going to push the wrist into a lot of flexion. Okay. It wouldn't be my first choice. Obviously, Colin Morikawa and John Rom have fairly weak left hands here and are able to, to make those work very nicely. But they would be kind of a little bit of the exception. Most players are not pushing their wrist into quite as much of that flexion. So again, it has, the grip has to match what we do with the wrist condition. So the more of the outlier, the more severe that we see wrist option B, we probably need a weaker grip uh, to a certain extent um, if we're going to have a lot of change in the wrist angle. Um, for some players, they basically get it flat or even just a little bit past uh, a flat wrist condition, um, can generally use a little bit more neutral grip. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more question. Uh, have you found a direct correlation between ulnar deviation of the leading wrist at address versus impact? Um, you know, a little bit depends on the swing style, uh, depends on the pattern shape, okay? So a lot of times the fade players will see a very low handle at setup. So there's more, you know, we're kind of setting this initial angle uh, a little bit more radially this way, okay? Um, and then at impact, certainly there's a little bit more of an ulnar movement where that value tends to be a little bit below um, its starting value. So that's something I'm always looking at is where did the radial value start, radial ulnar value start, and then where did it move to an impact? I don't see a lot of players going really massively beyond what they started with. Maybe, uh, maybe three to five degrees, maybe at the most. I don't see it, you know, a player really standing that handle up a ton. Um, from a lie angle perspective, that's going to make club fitting hard, et cetera. But draw players tend to start with their hand a little bit further forward, a little bit higher toward all their deviation, a little bit more. Um, so generally, they might have a little bit less change in that wrist angle. So when a fade player starts radially and then releases the club a little bit more ulnar, that is moving the sweet spot across the baseline a little bit, allowing them to get a fade. So moving the wrist from radial at setup to a little bit more ulnar deviation through impact is a good way to actually create a little bit of a slice, a little bit of a fade action. Um, so that's why I tend to see those, those fade players with the handle fairly low. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if we have uh, any time, but let's say quick question from Wayne, would you tend to get more players who cannot side bend enough into pattern A 
Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I would say this really as a quick screening, if you're dealing with a player that doesn't move their pelvis and thorax independently from one another, or, okay, or something that's not very flexible, essentially, um, teach them wrist option A. You know, the old adage about teaching the, uh, the hands are like two Aussie sheepdogs. If you don't train them properly, they kill all your sheep. Okay. And I think there's a lot of value in training the hand action, the wrist action with beginning players or poor players, having them understand some of these relationships and how to use that and make the body follow the arms and the wrist action. And that's kind of what wrist option A to a certain extent is. Um, the arms and the wrists are driving the whole thing. Okay. Wrist option B, the body's driving the whole thing. We're simply setting up some wrist angles that I can just keep pulling on the club and continue to turn and tilt. Um, but with our poor players that maybe can't side bend and rotate as quickly, certainly I think wrist option A is, is a beautiful, beautiful option. And even amongst tour players, I would still say the vast majority of tour players fall into wrist option A. Okay, we see maybe more players uh, coming up, moving toward uh, something like wrist option B. But I would still say your classic, you know, tour player swing is, is going to be generally some version of wrist option A. 